Welcome. Today, Dr. Elizabeth Otto speaks about the missing archive, Bauhaus designers and the Holocaust, offering us a new understanding of Bauhaus artists and their relationship to Nazism. After the talk, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art, based in New York. We research, discuss, publish and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. With this work, we commemorate their lives and achievements. I'm now honored to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Otto, who is Professor for Modern and Contemporary Art History and Gender Studies at the State University of New York at Buffalo. She has published widely on issues of gender and sexuality in the art, design, photography, and visual culture of 20th century Europe. Among Otto's books are Haunted Bauhaus, Occult Spirituality, Gender Fluidity, Queer Identities, and Radical Politics, published by MIT Press in 2019, which is the winner of the Northeast Popular Culture Association's 2020 Peter C. Rollins Prize, and Bauhaus Women, a Global Perspective, published by Bloomsbury in 2019 as well, co-authored with Dr. Patrick Rössler. Otto's work has been supported by fellowships from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts, the Getty Research Institute, the National Humanities Center, and during the current academic year, the Gerda Henkel Foundation and the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Research at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that kind introduction. And <clears throat> thank you to the audience members for coming. I'm really delighted to speak to you about this, albeit difficult topic. Uh, and I look forward to taking your questions after I speak. I think my talk will take about approximately 40 minutes. Um, so I'll get to it and let me share my slides with you. Okay. So this is just an introductory picture and here we go. The rationing of items like fuel, meat, fat, soap, coal, leather goods, and clothing uh, was a harbinger of the war in Germany. It was introduced six days prior to the September 1, 1939 invasion of Poland and would last throughout the war, even as, as the Germans began to lose that two front war, supplies of these precious goods gave out entirely. Such rationing also became the norm in France as soon as the country capitulated to Germany in June of 1940 with the South coming under German occupation and its regime of rationing in November of 1942. <clears throat> the card I show you here is for rations of clothing and textiles. It was issued in the village of Pibrac near Toulouse in the South of France. Such cards contain tickets worth a certain number of points that could be used like currency for specific articles. A skirt or blouse costs 20 points, a pair of socks five, and a winter, winter coat 100 points, a high point price to pay, especially given that this card only has a total of 168 points and was intended to last for 16 months. Managing a household, feeding and clothing a family were jobs that often fell to women, and these rations made their lives extremely challenging. This card was issued in November of 1943, a time when, as fashion historian Irina Gunther has noted, despite the approaching winter, such clothing cards had become nearly worthless to most women. Their simplicity, there, there simply was no clothing to be had, even in Germany itself, where citizens often had greater privileges than in occupied France. 
And yet this particular card still had value to its owner, Charlotte Flocon. In fact, for a while at least, it did much more than clothe her family and her. It saved her life because this card is a fake. It belonged, in fact, to Charlotte Rothschild or Rothschild Menzel, her married name. She was a metal designer trained at the Bauhaus in Germany who, a German Jew, was hiding in plain sight in occupied France. According to family members, throughout her years in France, Rothschild lived easily as a non-Jew with her blonde hair and gray eyes. And having fake papers like this certainly helped. This unspectacular and relatively useless document was still a part of the bureaucracy instituted by the German occupiers. Thus, it lent real authenticity to her new identity as a Swiss Gentile, <clears throat> the one that she had taken on in 1943 to keep herself safe. In fact, it was only when she was betrayed to the secret military police by a fellow member of the resistance in June of 1944 that she was deported to the French internment camp of Drancy and from there on to Auschwitz where she was murdered in August of 1944, together with her eldest daughter. She is among a total of eight Bauhaus members who were murdered at Auschwitz, where another Bauhaus member, Fritz Ertel, was working as a member of the SS and in charge of gas chamber and crema crematoria construction, among his other duties. But that is another story. The ration card was almost certainly made by a friend of Lotte Rothschild's, or Rothschild in German, you say Rothschild, but I'll, maybe I'll call her Rothschild since it's a bit easier. <clears throat> um, this friend of hers uh, was someone she knew from the Bauhaus, the graphic designer turned forger, Moses Bahilfer. He, like Rothschild and her husband, Albert Menzel, also a Bauhaus member, were active in the resistance in southern France, where Bahilfer worked forging documents. The real art, as his friend Menzel later recalled, was in the beautiful stamps that Bahilfer created. So the document here would not have been made from scratch, which would have been much more difficult, since the right paper would have had to be obtained, in addition to forging the various fonts and designs that covered its surface. Through a contact working in one of the offices that issued such ration cards, they would get blank cards that were uh, on the sly, of course, fill them out, and only needed to create the right local stamps. This was where Bahilfer was a specialist. Bahilfer studied at the Bauhaus for four years, a relatively long tenure, and he received his diploma in advertising and painting in February of 1932. Usually anything made by a Bauhaus member is considered fair game for consideration as part of the Bauhaus movement. And yet, histories of the Bauhaus art and design uh, school in Germany do not usually include items like this forged document, but they should. In my talk today, I scrutinize the work and lives of Bauhaus members who, through their imprisonment and often deaths in co the concentration camp system, have largely been lost to the history of the Bauhaus movement. Using archival sources, often scant materials preserved by family members and friends, including documents, photographs, private memoirs, and sometimes artworks, I aim to reconstruct aspect of these artists' work and lives and consider how to write histories that Nazi violence has taken from us. In a project that at time requires leaps of imagination to retrieve those whose work and lives were erased by Nazi violence, I negotiate the limits of the archive with restorative methods pioneered by scholars like Sadia Hartmann, while taking care to distinguish, in Carlo Ginzburg's words, truths from possibilities. So today I'll speak first uh, briefly about the history of the Bauhaus and my current book project from which this talk derives, um, where I'm aiming to uh, upset conventional histories of what happens to the movement <clears throat> once the Nazis come to power. Then I'll return to the subject of Charlotte or <clears throat> Charlotte or Lotta Rothschild, and how we bring her back into the discussion. 
along with perhaps some of the other 21 Bauhaus members known to have been murdered in the Holocaust. And I should say that number 21 is relatively new and it's the result not just of my research, but also that of scholars like Jens Uwe Fischer, Anke Blum and Patrick Hosler. <clears throat> in the final portion of my talk, I turn to consider those who survived the Holocaust, but who suffered unimaginably in, in unimaginably in Nazi concentration camps. Uh, and I focus on the example of the ba gay Bauhaus member, Richard Gruna, who spent much of the period of Nazi rule in the Sachsenhausen and Flossenburg concentration camps. <clears throat> For those of you unfamiliar or less familiar with the Bauhaus, it was a German art, architecture, and design school that existed from 1919 to 1933. So it actually, the formal period of the Bauhaus ends when the Nazis come to power in 1933. All three of the school's directors over the span of its 14 years of existence were architects. These uh, were Walter Gropius, Hannes Meyer and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Um, Gropius and Mies may be particular familiar to um, audience members as they both immigrated to the US in the 1930s. As I show you in the map on the right, the school existed in three different locations. First in Weimar, where it was initially founded by uniting crafts and fine art together into an egalitarian partnership. Um, and uh, in 1924, the school was ushered out of town practically when the local citizens voted in a right-wing government. From there, it went to the city of Dessau where it received a plot of land to purpose build a school that still stands. That's the building you can see in the right of the slide. Um, and uh, this is when it really came into a phase celebrating the unity of not just art and craft, but art and technology. Uh, here too, politics shut the school down in 1932, and it existed very briefly in Berlin, one semester only, before it was closed down for good by Nazi authorities in <clears throat> April of 1933. And in the center strip, I've included three pictures to indicate the range of things that were taught. Um, these included metal design, ceramics, woodworking, and furniture design, as well as photography, theater, and more traditional fine art, with painting taught by no less painters than Paul Clay and Vasily Kandinsky. As uh, scholars, including me, but not only me, have shown women were an important part of the school, and here I show you a table put together by two colleagues um, and published uh, that gives a sense of the different workshops that existed at the Bauhaus at various times. They didn't all exist at once. And the black bars show the number of women known to have studied and worked in these individual workshops. Histories of the legacies of the Bauhaus have most often focused on the idea that um, Bauhaus was most sustainable or only sustainable within the social and political framework of liberal democracy. Therefore, it becomes really after 1933, a history of a movement exclusively in exile, at least in conventional tellings. Such histories focus on those Bauhaus exiles who globalized the movement by bringing progressive modernism to Israel, the UK, and above all the US where at Black Mountain College, the new Bauhaus and Harvard University, uh, its members trained a generation of renowned artists and architects. Meanwhile, in Germany, these narratives tell us the Nazis closed the Bauhaus in April of 1933 and thereafter to be Bauhaus was to be considered degenerate art, end of story. Following this logic then, conventional narratives of the Bauhaus's global imprint tie it to the development of mid-century modern and the rise of progressive pedagogy, whereas Germany is left in the dust as retrogressive, without taste, and certainly without Bauhaus. 
So as I mentioned, this talk comes out of my pr uh, current book project called Bauhaus Under Nazism, which examines Bauhaus artists and their aesthetic practices within Germany after uh, April of 1933. For in fact, the movement had 1,400 members, if you count broadly, um, anyone who studied there or taught there. Um, and the majority of them, probably something like at least 80%, stayed in Germany. Counter to the narratives that focus on a transatlantic break between the Bauhaus and Nazi Germany, I look instead to the vast majority of the Bauhaus's known members who remained in Germany and Nazi-occupied Europe. So here <clears throat> I show you some images to evoke the chapters of part one, in which I focus on Bauhaus design kind of on the home front in fine art, homes, entertainment, and industrial architecture in Nazi Germany. In the upper left is a detail from a design submitted by the Bauhaus's director, Walter Gropius, which includes small Nazi uh, swastika flags flapping in the breeze. The lower left is a design for a mural by Bauhaus member Oskar Schlemmer, who uh, initially greeted the Nazi movement as one of renewal, but quickly lost his professorship and was classified among the degenerate artists. And on the right are examples of uh, home design with Bauhaus brand wallpaper that was sold throughout the Nazi period and graphic design and film. So in the first half, I really focus on how <clears throat> the diverse skill set that Bauhaus members were uh, encouraged to design, because it was a set of approaches rather than specific techniques, could very much fit into the national socialist landscape. Not only that, but these Bauhaus members helped to make nationalism appear cultured, modern, even exciting, and they offered German consumers distraction, a term that Siegfried Krakauer had applied to mass entertainment already in 1926. But in the case of Nazism, the government intentionally used this distraction to maintain its grip on power. The second part of the book from which I draw today's talk, I investigate how aspects of Bauhaus practice aesthetic approaches, and pedagogy endured in direct proximity to the most violent aspects of the Nazi regime, concentration camps, war, and genocide, but also how some Bauhaus members worked against the regime, or they created small glimmers of hope and healing in the face of the cruelties of Nazism. So here, just briefly, I show you the work of Hans Ehrlich at the top left, who uh, was a prisoner in Buchenwald concentration camp, but was uh, worked in the architecture office and delivered up a vision of Nazi kitsch that the SS very much favored. This saved his life. At the lower left is a photograph of women and children being held in a greenhouse prior to their massacre, which was taken by a Bauhaus member um, uh, when he witnessed this as a soldier in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, the top right, of course, uh, gestures to today's talk, and the lower right shows an image by uh, Friedel Dicker, who practiced something like art therapy using Bauhaus methods in Theresienstadt concentration camp. In the context uh, that I describe in part two, Bauhaus artists and designers manifest as perpetrators, victims, bystanders, and myriad roles in between. Writing of the horrors of, this, of his experience in Auschwitz, Primo Levi identified the shifting power relationships within Nazi organizational structures as something he called the gray zone. And these chapters offer case studies of how some Bauhaus members were passively or actively complicit in supporting the regime as others resisted or fell victim to it. Okay, and with that, I want to turn to uh, the particular material of this missing archive of the Bauhaus. Um, so the Bauhaus member, or ba Bauhaus, Bauhäusler, they called themselves, Charlotte Josephine Rothschild Menzel, Lotta <clears throat> or Lo to her friends and family, and later Lotta Flacon to her to the authorities in occupied France. 
She achieved many things in her 34 years of life. Because of the insecurities of her last years, none of her art or design work survives. But materials that allow us to imagine and understand aspects of Rothschild's life and work do exist. And these allow us to restore at least parts of her story to history and thus to counter the legacies of Nazism's eradication of Jewish individuals and their achievements. Born in 1909, Rothschild grew up in progressive Frankfurt. Under the headline of the new Frankfurt, the city was a hotbed of architectural modernism that strove to address an acute housing, housing sort, shortage, excuse me, with well-designed and affordable apartments. Rothschild became a small part of this movement in 1927 when, at 17, she enrolled in the Städtelschule, an art school in Frankfurt, and began two years of study in the um, workshop for, uh, uh, for basically the metal workshop, directed by Werkbund member Hans Warnecke. In the 1930 letter of recommendation for uh, Rothschild, Warnecke described the workshop's focus. He wrote, quote, the apprenticeship pertained to the creation of models for mass production of general purpose appliances. He identified Rothschild as having what he called a very special aptitude for inventing modern devices for fabrication. Here I show you some of her teacher's work from this period to suggest the kinds of designs uh, on which she would have assisted. Uh, created in simple forms and materials, steel, wood, and paper, the lamp in particular that Varnecke made, the one in the middle of your screen, is indebted to designs from the Bauhaus, such as Willem Wagenfeld's now iconic 1923 Bauhaus table lamp. And it was most likely Varnecke who suggested that Rothschild move to the Bauhaus for continued studies. Just 19, Rothschild entered the Dessau Bauhaus on April 9th, 1929, under the, the matriculation number 334. Menzel, her later husband, recalled first seeing her in the canteen, a beautiful young woman who wore the fashionable unisex Fodujita haircut, a kind of severe bob that was common among Bauhäusler. Here is Lowe, said his friend Werner David Feist, who later took this photograph that you see here. Young and full of pluck, Rothschild soon became a fixture of Bauhaus life and inspired quite a number of photographers to capture her image. So we do have a number of photographs of this period. In this particular image, Feist shows her reclining with her eyes closed in an image that is both a study of her beauty and a Bauhaus exercise in form and texture. Okay, the next one is a nude. I'm just gonna tell you so you're not totally shocked. Um, but I think it's a wonderful photograph. And I actually, <clears throat> um, I know uh, Lotta Rothschild's surviving granddaughter and I checked with her to make sure it's okay to represent her grandmother uh, this way. And she said she was a free woman and that I should go for it. So uh, Lotta Rothschild's friend, Ethel Mittag Foder took a magnificent photograph of Rothschild bathing out outdoors. Shot from below and against the clouds, Rothschild is timeless in her unashamed nudity, and she's specifically modern, her short hair bound up in a jaunty polka dotted kerchief. She appears engrossed in washing herself, as the blur of her right hand attests. Mittag Fodor also photographed Rothschild and Menzel together. They appear here as a modern couple, intertwined, mutually supporting, and deep in conversation. Menzel later noticed, noted on the back of this photograph, um, so this man here who becomes her husband, wrote on the back of the photograph that it was taken in his Bauhaus studio in 1929. <clears throat> what began as an affair at the Bauhaus would be the defining partnership for Lotta Rothschild's life. Menzel was uh, the Bauhaus, a member of the Bauhaus Theater Workshop. He was also a communist activist and in secret, the editor of 
uh, the Kostufra, which was the communist student fractions newspaper called simply in lowercase letters Bauhaus. Rothschild was already a leftist in Frankfurt and absorbed communist ideas from uh, a family member who was a militant leftist and intellectual. At the Bauhaus, she joined the communist students group and likely joined the communist party itself. We have only general outlines of Rothschild's Bauhaus activities. She completed the basic course in one semester and uh, entered the metal workshop in the fall of 1929, a continuation of what she'd been doing in Frankfurt. Metal is, we know, one of the most male dominated workshops at the Bauhaus, despite the fact that until the previous summer, uh, sorry, until that summer, uh, 1929, it had been headed, it was headed by a woman, Marianne Brandt. Of the 11 women who enrolled in the metal workshop, Brandt is the only one to obtain her degree. The workshop we do know at the time was collaborating with uh, firms including the Candom lighting design uh, firm in Leipzig to design mass produced lighting. Um, and surely Rothschild worked in this area. <clears throat> in his certification letter of July 5th, 1930, the director at the time, Hannes Meyer, noted that Rothschild is particularly well suited to the metalworking trade. She has a talent for drawing and during her studies in the metal workshop was particularly interested in designing lamps. Rothschild had some stage experience from her youth in Frankfurt, so it was perhaps inevitable that she would join the school's experimental left wing theater collective, the young stage at the Bauhaus. The pieces that the students put on were ones they wrote collectively, and they often took on current events, even at the Bauhaus itself. The uh, picture I show you on the left was a parody visit to the city by Professor L. And uh, Rothschild, who you see seated on the right of the two people, was did apparently a hilarious impression of Nina Kandinsky, um, kind of a send up of the Kandinsky's was a part of this. And on the right is another uh, piece called Three Against One. One year into her studies, Rothschild was immersed in the powerful collective energy of the communist Bauhaus and had become one of its public faces. At the end of her second semester, however, in April of 1930, Meyer wrote to her parents that he thought she had tuberculosis. His diagnosis was wrong, uh, but she was sent home. And this was the end of her time at the Bauhaus, but not of her Bauhaus friendships and circles, which would endure until her death. She made her way to uh, Berlin, and uh, so did Menzel, who joined her soon since he had been expelled from the Bauhaus for being a communist. From August 1, 1930 through the end of that year, Rothschild worked for uh, the progressive but small Berlin lighting firm of Goldschmied und Schwabe, uh, designing uh, lamps, as far as we know. She lost her job at the end of that year because of the ongoing Great Depression, but her letter of recommendation still does exist and notes that, uh, you know, it's very positive and notes that Miss Rothschild saw, solved all assignments, both formal and technical, completely independently. She also worked independently in our uh, advertising department in numerous cases and made very good designs. Many of our shop window decorations originate from her. There is a photograph that I show you here of Goldschmidt and Schwabe's shop window that was taken perhaps during the time that uh, Rothschild worked there. <clears throat> it was published in the design journal Die Form in 1931, shortly after she had left. The only designer named is Rothschild's Bauhaus colleague, Otto Rittweger, who also worked at the firm. Um, and his lamps are featured here. We know these designs are by him, but the others, it's not entirely clear. And I wonder, for example, this one that <clears throat> also takes on aspects of Bauhaus lamp design like her teacher in Frankfurt used. Perhaps it could be a design she worked on or even completed. 
the shop window itself also has a module set up that could be moved around to display different uh, objects in, in a dynamic way. And this too could be something in which she had a hand. We cannot know for sure, but considering these possibilities allows a little bit of her design work perhaps to come to life again. Rothschild and Menzel married in 1931, and their first child, Ruth, was born early the following year. Immediately after the Nazi seizure of power, already in February of 1933, Menzel and Rothschild moved from Berlin to Paris, since as communists, they were in grave danger in Germany. In France, they had two more children, Catherine in 1937 and Henri in 1939. With the outbreak of the war in 1939, Menzel was interned in a camp for Germans and enlisted in the Foreign Legion for a year from February 1940 on. <clears throat> During that time, Rothschild was alone in Paris with her three small children, working as a technical translator in the aviation industry, a job she would continue to hold once she moved to the south of France uh, the following year. Um, when she went there, uh, Rothschild put their Parisian belongings, including any of her surviving work that we know of, into storage uh, and traveled with the children south to Toulouse, where they were living outside the city in a village called Pibrac. There too, she was the family's main breadwinner with, as a technical translator. Um, and she and her husband were per, at least peripherally involved in the French resistance. Uh, even more, ever more conscious of the rising danger, in the fall of 1941, she tried to contact a cousin in the US to help her and her family emigrate, but was not successful. In 1943, the stridently anti-religious couple had their three children baptized and then for their safety, sent them away to school or into hiding. And this, of course, brings us to Rothschild's acquisition of fake papers. Uh, Rothschild and Menzel briefly housed a man who was a, a resistance member and was subsequently arrested. Under torture, he gave up Rothschild's name and her Jewish identity. She was arrested at work by the secret police and uh, Menzel and their oldest daughter, Ruth, who was briefly home from school, were also brought in for questioning. The adults were interrogated about their contacts in the resistance and then asked for an address to send Ruth. Having insisted so vehemently that they knew no one locally, Menzel thought that this was a trick. He said that Ruth should stay with her mother. That, he later recalled, was the fundamental mistake. Rothschild and Ruth were sent to the internment camp of Trancy five days later. This is in late June, 1944. The camp <clears throat> was in France, but was run by Germans. A native speaker, Rothschild became the spokesperson for her dormitory room. One day she stood up to the captain's notorious, the camp's notorious head, the Austrian SS man Alois Brunner, uh, when he slapped a woman in her room. She said to him, supposedly quietly, I didn't think a German officer could slap a woman. This small bit of moral courage indeed cost her dearly. Brunner put her on the list for the last major transport to the East and told her she should decide whether Ruth, who in the Nazi system was considered a half Jew and therefore did not have to be deported, should go as well. Here the story is taken up by Lily Segal, a German Jewish resistance member who was also in Trancy and wrote a memoir. <clears throat> For two nights, Segal tried to convince Rothschild to leave Ruth behind as allied forces were approaching Paris and the camp would almost certainly be liberated soon. Indeed, three weeks later, it was. But Rothschild insisted that she could protect her daughter as long as they were together. On uh, July 31st, 1944, Lotta, uh, Rothschild, and Ruth were deported to Auschwitz. Segal was on the train as well, and she testified that they, <clears throat> they being uh, 
Rothschild and Ruth, had volunteered to be in a freight car with orf orphan children uh, in order to help them. And uh, with these cars, as Sagal notes, all of the occupants were sent directly to the gas chamber upon arrival in Auschwitz, whereas otherwise it's possible that Rothschild and Ruth would have been selected for work. The official date of their death is August 2nd, 1944. Menzel experienced the liberation in Toulouse and waited for Lotta and Ruth. Months later, a friend who had survived Auschwitz explained that his wife and daughter would not be coming back. When he returned to Paris with Catherine and Henri in 1946, he learned that because he and Rothschild were considered German by the locals, their belongings in storage had been seized and sold. Nothing was left. In subsequent years, Menzel, rejecting all things German, began to use the name Flocon. It was his wife's chosen name for her forged papers after Rothschild and Menzel. This was her final last name and the one that almost saved her. And here I show you uh, the recently laid memorial stones to all three family members. I want to turn now very briefly, uh, before I happily take your questions, to a different but related case of a Bauhaus member's missing archive, that of Richard Kruna. As with Rothschild, most of Kruna's art is gone, but unlike her, he survived his time in concentration camps, and he was able to use his art to bear witness to what he had seen and experienced. He spent the majority of the Nazi years imprisoned, nine of them in concentration camps, including Sachsenhausen and Flossenburg. He experienced the last days of the liberation in Flossenburg, terribly weak and sick, but he later recalled he clung to life by drawing. He was among the Flossenburg prisoners sent on a forced so-called death march, this one to the Baltic Sea in April of 1945, during which time he managed to escape. He made it home to Kiel and the care of his sister, broken but still drawing. Already upon his return, he started to work on a series of lithographs that was published in full two years later under the title, The Passion of the 20th Century. The title gestures to uh, traditions of Christian passion, uh, the Christian passion narrative, which shows the events of Christ's life and represents his suffering and death. In its traditional form, the passion story offers redemptions, redemption through Christ's suffering. But that is not the case for Gruna's pictures. They show a world of sheer brutality that as in the case of the cruel SS guard, taunting a prisoner in the center picture, borders on caricature. But Gruna aims his picture stylization as a force to convey the horrors of the camps to a broad audience, uh, viewers that he sought to show what he had experienced and seen. Uh, but these viewers were often in 1945 incredulous and unwilling to believe the degree of systemized cruelty in the camps. The Passion series, when it was printed, so lithographs can be printed in multiple, um, was uh, in two portfolios. And I'm still working out the exact, exactly what was in it. Uh, but it seems to have focused on daytime as here, which was made up of torture, hunger, and forced labor, and nighttime. Uh, and here are three images from that. Works from the other series take place in darkness, mostly at night, as in the first two images from the left. The far left depicts prisoners taking down the bodies of their fellow inmates who have been hanged. The living men are so emaciated that they are hard to distinguish from the dead, but the tenderness that they extend to their comrades infuses the image. The center picture shows the nighttime barracks, so overcrowded that prisoners sleep in the crawl space on the floor. Yet a game of cards among those awake evokes camaraderie among the prisoners. The image on the right takes place in the darkness of the camp's crematoria, where prisoners consign the bodies of their fellow inmates to the flames. If Gruna's Passion series has any compassion or redemption in it, it is the care and camaraderie among the inmates. 
I'd say just briefly that this middle picture uh, does evoke a well now well-known photograph. And I don't think he would have seen it, although the uh, relationship between the two images is striking. But I think comparing them also illuminates a real difference between them. The Im image on the right shows prisoners being lim uh, liberated, whereas the one on the left um, shows prisoners in daily life kind of turned inward to the days of the camp, one very much like another, with no guarantee that these prisoners will ever be freed. Gruner's intention was to testify about his experience, and he showed the passion pictures in several German cities, including Lüneburg, uh, Nuremberg, and Munich. But the public, for the most part, did not want to see these images. When the picture is hung in Kiel, his hometown, someone broke into the exhibition at night and destroyed the lithographs. Luckily, they were multiples, um, but still, the gesture is a definitive rejection of the work. Gruna, a committed leftist Bauhäusler, who, as a gay man, had suffered unspeakably under the Nazi regime, still felt driven to tell the world what Germans had done to their fellow humans. But in a country that was in stark denial about the Nazi crimes, and in West Germany, where male homosexuality remained criminal until the 1990s, very few were willing to listen. In fact, Gruna was never compensated for his suffering and was subsequently charged and fined for being gay. His was not an easy life. If we look back, though, to 1922, Gruna arrived at the Bauhaus at the age of 19 in a moment of hope and promise for him. His harmonization teacher, Gertrude Grunau, seemed to know that he might have been on the verge of discovering something about himself. She wrote, Mr. Gruna still requires some time to gain greater peace in the new world that arises in Weimar and the Bauhaus for him. His powers, however, seem certainly able to become remarkable. After one more semester, he still was not accepted into uh, the workshop system, and he decided to leave the Bauhaus with his skill set uh, with him. He went on to become a committed socialist and used this in his design practice where he did projects like this, working with a group of children to memorialize what they called the Red Children, the Children's Red Republic, a, a summer camp of 2000 children that was uh, self-governed and where they then worked with uh, Kruna and his friend, another designer, Niels Brodersen, to memorialize the camp in, uh, in this book. Shortly after the advent of Nazi rule in January, Kruna moved to Berlin, probably to find a more open life as a gay man uh, in a city where homosexuality was still illegal, but was um, celebrated, even though there was this paragraph 175, which made being gay illegal. <clears throat> he, uh, Kruna also worked on an anti- Nazi newspaper called Kurze Pause or Short Break, um, but he managed to deta escape detection until in 1934, he was arrested not for his anti-Nazi work, but specifically for being gay under paragraph 175. He was convicted as a homosexual and spent the next 11 years almost entirely in prisons and concentration camps. Uh, this was from 1934 to 1935, and then he was rearrested in 1936 and remained in camps until 1945. Among these, first was uh, Sachsenhausen, where he spent four years uh, until he was moved to Flossenburg, a forced labor camp with a stone quarry uh, known um, particularly for um, its torture of gay inmates who were routinely given the most brutal and deadliest work. It is extremely unusual for anyone to have survived the concentration camp system for as long as Gruna did. The fact that he was a socialist might have helped, as he might have been able to draw on those networks within the camp. But the main reason that Richard Gruna survived both camps is that he was an artist. And that was a skill that members of the SS who ran the camps valued. 
We have only a description of Gruna's work in the so-called Majduba or painting studio. Um, together with other prisoners, we know he made children's books and probably would have uh, done the kinds of kitschy paintings that they all created that were uh, favored by SS members. Um, whoops, there, we skipped over it. Another man imprisoned there, the Austrian graphic designer Hugo Wahlleitner, uh, um, created a book here, I show it to you here, that's the cover of it, uh, containing 30 some drawings of his experience. And he made a representation of the uh, painting studio in Flossenburg concentration camp, which you see here on the left. You can see he appears somewhat incredulous at and a little stiff in front of these SS men who are showing him a watercolor that he is uh, supposed to copy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he seems rather bewildered, but at the same time, we know that while it was much safer to be in the painting studio than in the rock quarry, it was dangerous at any time to be around the SS, and uh, the, they, the SS men never let the prisoners forget that. You can see a truncheon held in the right hand of one of the guards. They made works that looked something like this. Here's one made by another uh, member of the painting studio, the Czech painter uh, Franzek uh, Michel. Um, and Gruna probably was forced to do these kinds of paintings as well. Landscapes, probably kitschy, cozy interiors and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so Gruna was forced likely to recreate the landscape of Flossenburg uh, Castle, which you can see here as a kind of sunny paradise. It would be only later that he would get the chance to freely express what life in Flossenburg had in his eyes really been like. So to conclude, I'd call attention to the material I've shared with you today as part of a missing archive of the Bauhaus. This is the material that never made it into mainstream histories of this highly influential art and design movement. In many cases, this is because the works, drawings, designs, paintings, and objects don't exist anymore. But as I've tried to show in this talk, there are ways to bring these histories to light textual accounts placed alongside related contemporaneous images get us closer to knowing what an artist or designer was working on. And the family and friends that supported them sometimes come to light too, as in the image by Mo uh, Moses Bahelfer at the top right of um, forged documents. Even thinking beyond the Bauhaus, I'd like to call on us all to look for the histories we're missing. Often creative people have been written out of the story precisely when they have been victims of great crimes. Prejudice, wars, and genocide have taken them from us and destroyed much or all of their work. Expanding our historical gaze enriches our understanding of the past. It allows us to learn about the lives and work of, say, a young female metal designer from Frankfurt or a gay graphic designer from Kiel before the prejudice and violence of the Nazi era rendered them partially or totally silent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, this uh, was, an, is, was an amazing talk and um, I'm, I'm absolutely stunned how much new material you uh, found and are still finding. Um, this is absolutely dazzling. Um, I have a few questions here um, about, yeah, Schlemmer. Uh, huh. uh, the, the proposal, I think he's the artist you showed the shortest, <laughs> but <laughs> here we go. Uh, Schlemmer's proposal for a workhouse. Linda asked, what was that, that supposed to be? Who was to work there? So, um, you know, I might have misspoken, but to clarify, it, it was for a mural, or I may, might have um, sort of garbled my words. It, it was for a mural um, mm -hmm. in a, um, let me just get out of this, see if I can share it. Um, 
Yeah. So it was for a mural uh, for the Deutsches Museum in Munich, for, so for a museum. Um, it was in a workhouse. Uh, and Schlemmer, you know, I mean, in times of political polarization, I probably, it won't be news to this audience to say people get some crazy ideas. Um, he was not a Nazi, um, but he thought that this perhaps would be a moment of national renewal and coming together. And so this design of all of these blonde figures raising their, um, their uh, arms together here, I'll just share it briefly um, so people can see it. Um, we're talking about this image here, uh, I think is his, um, you know, his interest in, in a sort of coming together under Nazism. What in fact happened is he immediately lost his professorship um, and he uh, was included in the Degenerate Art Show, which was the main propaganda exhibition put on by the Nazis. And um, he lived in poverty in the city of Wuppertal, working at a paint factory where basically there was a benefactor who supported um, artists and he he died um, very unwell. So um, yeah, I, I think Schlemmer is important and complicated. I, I do want to emphasize he wasn't a, a Nazi ever, but um, he was certainly more involved with the regime than we're often led to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ruth is asking about, was he just considered a degenerate artist or uh, where the artists sent to concentration camps and then like did it mean to be um, classified as degenerate if I understand the question right uh, did that mean that you would be uh, sent to concentration camps or uh, what did it mean to be a, de a degenerate artist? Right. Yeah, that's a great question because I think there's often that implication and that really was not the case. In fact, there are a lot of cases of people like Herbert Bayer and um, my friend and colleague Patrick Russler just um, is in the process of publishing, I think it's available for pre-order, a new book on um, Herbert Bayer, the very important graphic designer who comes to the US. Um, his work, uh, he stayed in Nazi Germany and was a very successful graphic designer, also including for ideo ideological propagandistic uh, things that he didn't necessarily believe, but he certainly made them look very classy. Um, and yet his work was included in the Degenerate Art Show. So it was possible, degenerate, the Degenerate Art Show and the, the related exhibitions were often put together very quickly uh, by people kind of pulling things out of the archives. Often they didn't know much about uh, the people that, that they were pulling from. So it was not a death sentence. It also wasn't good and was a part often of people losing professorships, losing work, being uh, prohibited from working in the future. But there are these cases where one could both be considered degenerate and still be working successfully for the regime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so David says, uh, seems to me that the rift going through German society in the 30s also went through the Bauhaus and produced Nazis, Mitläufer and opportunists, as well as resistors to the system. Would you agree that the Bauhaus was closed rather due to its progressive mindset than to its progressive design approaches? Jews were in the, uh, were hunted everywhere, also at the Bauhaus. So that's <laughs> kind of uh, not a, classif a classifying um, uh, characteristic. Yeah, right. Yeah, thanks for this question. I mean, I see the um, this study in a way as almost, I, I think of it kind of like, you know, in, in trees, you can do a core sample where you sort of, have this long tubular knife that goes through a tree. And so it's it's a way of looking at, you know, a kind of micro history um, that, that also is pretty macro because it, it involves so many people. Um, but it's a way of looking at, of course, phenomena that were much broader. Um, to your question about the, the Bauhaus, I mean, the Bauhaus, I think, was closed for ideological reasons. In fact, uh, there was, um, the Nazis were willing to reopen it. Mies van der Rohe negotiated for this. 
uh, but the terms included, um, of course, synchronizing much more with Nazi ideology, uh, firing people on the staff who were foreign born like Vasily Kandinsky, even though he was arguably the most famous painter in Europe at the time, um, and terms that the Master's Council decided not to accept. But, um, you know, there is an alternate universe where it still existed. Um, and the fact that it was shut down, I think sometimes is overplayed is really, you know, kind of used as almost propaganda for the Bauhaus to suggest that the movement was entirely clean of Nazism. And that's just really not true. Um, and I'd say the other thing I'm sort of using the Bauhaus to fight against is this constant idea that bad people have terrible taste, right? That no Nazis could like progressive design. And that certainly was not true. Um, there were a lot of people in the regime who wanted it to appear modern, forward thinking, progressive. Um, and it was a kind of forward thinking. It's just not one that we can have any respect for, but um, mm -hmm. they had a vision of the future. It just was very dark. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, so, Two questions. What um, what happened happened to Lotte's other two children? Yeah, so one of them is still alive, and she's been really generous with sharing um, family memoirs, personal memoirs, the few documents that still exist. She's um, I, I think it's no secret for me to say she holds that um, clothing, cloth, and textile rationing card. Um, as well as a few photographs. Uh, and she was um, hidden on a farm and uh, survived. Um, and her younger brother was hidden in a religious school and also survived. So they lived, um, they had long lives. I, I know Catherine had uh, a daughter and has granddaughters. So, you know, the, the female line of feisty women uh, <clears throat> continues, which I think is a lovely, a lovely thing. Um, so yeah, but they grew up without their mother and without their sister and having, you know, experienced trauma, trauma while they were hidden, um, you know, among the hidden children of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So Ver Verena is asking, um, and we are nearing, uh, I think we have two more questions, I would say, uh, because we're running out of time. Could you speak a bit more about Gruner? There was a question, was he Jewish? Um, uh, uh, and uh, But there's another question about his work during the Weimar Republic. Uh, for instance, also the photo book, the Kinder uh, Republic uh, that you showed. So I'm so sorry, but uh, just your entire question, this was frozen for a minute. Do you mind repeating it? Not at all. Uh, so uh, the next question is uh, uh, has two parts. Uh, one, uh, it's, uh, they're both about Mr. Gruner mm -hmm. um, and Richard Gruner. Was he Jewish? Second question uh, about his work as, uh, uh, in the Weimar Republic uh, beyond the Kinder Republic. What kind yeah. of hard work did he do? Yeah, he was not Jewish. Um, so he was, you know, one of the um, inmates of concentration camps who we remember who was there for the pink triangle, um, as far as I know. And I don't think he also, he was a socialist and I think that did help him, but not that much. It was really because um, he was an artist. I don't think he had sort of a hybrid triangle that would have indicated that he was a socialist. Um, during the Weimar Republic, you know, he's another case where a lot of his work doesn't survive, but because he, some of it was mass produced, there are a few of these projects with um, children. There's a, a biography of him that um, in Kiel, they've done some good work and some exhibitions that have highlighted other examples of graphic design that he did, mostly for um, for socialist causes, um, also working with children. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he's also included, that book is included in an exhibition that MoMA did, which I think is called Growing Up Modern, um, but it was it's about childhood and modern design. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a bit on him for that, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you for your emphasis on the missing archive as a way to begin to ask questions that pierce the distorted narrative of Bauhaus, 
we have all been told as an intrinsically liberal and exiled. Oh, okay. Sorry, you, I, yeah. sorry you froze. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry about that. Okay, could you uh, repeat? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you for your emphasis on the missing archive as a way to begin to ask questions that pierce the distorted narrative of Bauhaus. We have all been told as an intrinsically liberal and then exiled art movement. I would be interested in you following, following up a bit more about the missing explicitly Nazi identified or active Bauhaus members, such as the one Lotte apparently encountered that you mentioned in passing. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, I don't know that she encountered him, but she certainly encountered his work, right? At, um, because he was in charge of uh, crematoria and gas chamber construction at Auschwitz. Um, this is Fritz Ertel, and um, there's been uh, some, some good work on him, mostly published in German. Paul Jaskot has published a bit on him in English. Um, and uh, Adena Seegars, I believe I've got her name right, in Germany published um, a master's thesis and there've been a few other scholars um, working on him. But he's kind of the far extreme of someone who joined the Death's Head SS um, and worked as an architect. Um, he was eventually found out, his family tried to cover for him and say he was just working in Austria at home. Uh, but, you know, he's in the various meetings of, of um, minutes of meetings, and uh, it's, it's clear that he knew what was going on and was involved. There's some evidence that he may have left intentionally because he did not like what he was doing and gone to the front. But, you know, these are the kinds of things people always said left later. We don't know why he didn't stay until the very end at Auschwitz, but certainly he is the most overt example of Bauhaus design in the service of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My last question, Elizabeth, is how do you find, how do you, how did you find all this? Because there's a question whether there's material, some of your material in the Tel Aviv Bauhaus uh, Museum. And we know there are Bauhaus museums in Weimar, D Dessau and Berlin. Uh, is that where you found your material or uh, how do you find the missing archives? Yeah, so this is a, a project, you know, looking at all of these, you know, maybe 800 some people I could spend the rest of my life doing and um, that doesn't seem realistic. Um, and so, you know, it's talking to other scholars, talking to archivists, Google, I mean, Lotte Rothschild's uh, story, I think I found through Google, there's a French project called Con Convoy 77 that looks at every single person who was on that train um, and has done micro histories of them. And they were able to put me in touch with Lotte Rothschild's um, Rothschild's surviving daughter. Um, and then I should say, I have very good uh, work colleagues. I've mentioned Patrick Rossler, also Anka Bloom. And the three of us, um, I've been working on this for years. They've been doing some related projects and we decided to team up and we're working on an exhibition that will be held at the um, Bauhaus Museum in Weimar. It opens in May of 2024, so next May. Um, and that will include some of these works, other works, and you know, the three of us together, again, talking with other scholars, we're running a conference, um, are drawing together as much as we can to kind of retell this story. So collaboration really is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely is. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I uh, just can second the, all the thank yous and uh, uh, for, for this excellent uh, presentation, um, but also for this very important research that you do in unco uh, uncovering those hidden stories and uh, bringing uh, those people back to life uh, that have been forgo forgotten until now. So thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thanks to the audience. Thank you.